That's awesome. I love you guys. Good to see you. Uh, Luke is where we're going to be. Turn your Bibles there. We're going to be uh, traversing Luke 22, Luke 23 this morning. So thanks, band. Again, give it up for the band. You guys are amazing. So, um, so I, uh, I got a, uh, uh, about a month ago, I got a thing in the mail, and it said, you are summoned for jury duty. That's what first service said, too. Oh. Anyone look forward to serving on jury, jury duty, right? The only thing that makes jury duty fun is get, calling the night before and getting excused. And that's exactly, so the, for the past month, that was my number one prayer on my prayer list. Get excused from jury duty. Because that's, talk about inconvenient, right? Talk about just like, do I really want, I mean, I understand as a citizen, it is your obligation, it's your duty to do this. But let's just be honest, who looks forward to this at all, right? Like, I've been called the jury duty three times in my life. Anyone, can anyone top that? Anyone got four? Four? You, grand jury? Wow. Talk to Adam later about that. That's fun. First time I ever got called to jury duty, here's what I, I planned what I was going to say, and it is, you can't handle the truth. I thought, this is the way out right here. Like, just channel a little Jack Nicholson, right, and a few good men. Who doesn't like a good, good, uh, good uh, courtroom drama? John Grisham's made millions off it, right? We all like watching, you know, all the different law and order shows. Like, how many, can, can we just stop on the law and order stuff? Like, do we need to CSI Yuma? I mean, really, are we that, are we that desperate? <laughs> like, yeah, Casa Grande, they definitely need it down there. Love those guys. All right. So, you know, trial, trial scenes, courtroom scenes, a lot of fun. Uh, the most famous trial in all of human history is the trial Jesus was on. Um, that's what we're going to look at this morning in Luke 22, 23. But before we get there, you ever thought about putting Jesus on trial? Like, who does that? Uh, it's actually been done in history. Matter of fact, state of Arizona, as if there's not, a, not other debacles we can focus on. Uh, but 1970, Arizona lawyer decided that, you know, I'm going to file a suit against Jesus in the amount of $100,000 for damages done to his secretary's home during a lightning strike because insurance had refused to pay for it. And it said in the insurance, a an act of God. So this lawyer goes, we're going to go ahead and sue Jesus. And I think he was assuming that he had a strong chance of winning because he was pretty sure the defendant would fail to appear in court, <laughs> right? So wisely, you know, they, they threw out the case, right? But I'm pretty sure you don't want to find yourself in a courtroom with Jesus, right? Because I heard the cross-examination can be brutal, oh, right? And, let, and let's be honest, there's actually a bit of truth to this. Because what we're going to discover this morning is we're going to turn everything we know about the trials of Jesus upside down. Because it's really not Jesus who's put on trial. It's all the people that were involved in this whole process that they themselves were put on trial. And let's just be honest. When it comes to us existing as human beings, we ourselves are put on trial by God. And his goal is to examine our hearts to, so that we ultimately turn to know him and to love him, to worship him. See, the most famous trial in all of human history was not that Jesus was put on trial. It's that everyone who encountered him at this moment in his path, on his path to the crucifixion, they themselves were put on trial. We're going to look at five things this morning. Five conditions of the heart that are exposed in this text that God is, is trying to be aware of something. He's trying to get our attention with something. Because you need to know that it wasn't the, the, the wickedness of men and women that, that crucified Jesus. This is not a situation that's out of control. This is a situation that you need to understand was preordained by God. Jesus is the one who willingly laid down his life for his sheep. We look at this and go, well, look at all the sinful people that put Jesus on the cross. They didn't put Jesus on the cross. God ordained for this to happen. Acts chapter 2, read it sometime. It's amazing. God foreordained this. None of this is out of control. All this falls within the, the sovereign power of our God to bring about 
the results that he had predestined to take place. Jesus isn't on trial. Matter of fact, you look at Jesus during this whole process, and he's, excuse the, the phrase, he's cool as a cucumber. He's not worried about anything. I'm not saying that minimizes or trivializes his suffering. The agony, the injury, the pain was real. But Jesus knew that there was a crown on the other side of that cross. Before the foundation of the world, God had predestined this event to take place. And we encounter six trials in what we're going to read this morning. Six trials, what we would call a kangaroo court. You ever heard that phrase before? It just seems like it's a ping pong game, right? Going back and forth, there's three Jewish trials, there's three Roman trials, right? The Jews are trying to get him on trumped up religious charges, blasphemy, he claims to be God. The, the, the Romans are trying to get him on political uh, accusations that he's a revolutionary and he's come to, come to disrupt uh, the true king who is Caesar because he claims to be king. And you're just going to see no one has any clue what they're doing except for God who's center stage in this drama who again in this narrative reveals more about us than I think we've ever ever considered before so turn your Bibles Luke 22 we're going to finish 22 go into 23 we're going to cover a lot of ground but we're going to do it pretty expediently this morning so Luke 22 is where we're going to be and to this day, I just want you to know that what you're going to see in this whole account is that Jesus is innocent. No less than four times is he declared innocent, and yet they still crucify him. And what's amazing is people still put the Son of God on trial today, and even today, no one can find fault with Christ. And so, we turn to Luke 22. Look at verse 54. We, we looked at this briefly last week. Having been arrested, they laid him... Uh, they led him away and brought him to the house of the high priest. So circle that word high priest. That's Annas, A-N-N-A-S. He was a retired high priest. Once you're a high priest, you're kind of a high priest forever. He's getting older. He still has a lot of influ influence in the, in the region. So Luke doesn't name him. Other gospel writers do. Skip to verse 63. And then the men who were holding Jesus in Annas' residence were mocking him and beating him. So this is the scene where you just see people just adding insult and injury to, to a, a man, God-man, who's already weary, he's already tired. Verse 64, they blindfolded him and were saying to him, prophesy, who is this the one, who's the one who has hit you? This is the prophecy game, right? Like, it's almost like they're treating him like a pinata and they're just basically saying, if you're truly a pop prophet, name the person that just hit you. It's just sad. Verse 65, they were saying to uh, other things to him, which Luke doesn't chronicle, but it all led to blaspheming Christ. Verse 66, and when it was day, they take Jesus to the council of the elders, also known as the Sanhedrin. Uh, they were assembled, both chief priests, scribes, and they led him away to their council chamber. So this is early, early, early Friday morning, right? If you are the Christ, tell us. And he said to them, if I tell you, you will not believe. So there's a, there's a message of unbelief here, right? And if I ask you a question, you're not going to answer me. This is a no-win situation, right? Christ is in. But, verse 69, from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the, of the power of God. And they all said, are you the Son of God? And then he says to them in, in, in three simple words, yes, I am. Circle that phrase, I am. That's so important. And they said, what further evidence do we need? We have heard it ourselves from his own mouth, right? He claims to be God. Verse 1, chapter 23. And then they take him to Pilate. The Jews had no right to execute anyone as they were governed by the Romans. So all they could do is bring someone who's accused of something and hope Rome brings forth the punishment of execution. This now lies in Pilate's hands, right? And they begin to accuse him, saying, we found this man. No, notice now the, the tone changes. No longer is it about blasphemy. Pilate doesn't care if he calls himself God. But they start to make this about politics. Look what they say. We found this man misleading our nation. We have found him talking about, you know, people not having to pay taxes to Caesar, right? They're just placating to, to Pilate's just his wheelhouse, right? And that he himself calls himself king. See, with the Jews, he claims to be the Messiah, the Christ. Now they're saying, hey, he also claims to be king as if he's vying for Caesar's throne. Pilate says and turns to him and says, are you king? He says, it is as you say. 
So he doesn't deny it. He affirms it. But Pilate's looking at this guy who's been beat up. He's bleeding. He's a mess. And I think Pilate in his mind goes, this is no king. So therefore he declares, look at in verse 4, I find no guilt in this man. And they kept insisting, saying, well, ever since he's been preaching, you know, years ago, Judea, Galilee, you know. Uh, and all of a sudden Pilate hears, oh wait, Galilee, that's not my jurisdiction. That's Herod. Go send him to Herod. Just wants to, just wants to wash his hands of any responsibility. Send him to Herod, who was this king in this region of, of Galilee. And when they had learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, verse 7, he sent him to Herod, who himself was in Jerusalem at the time. So Pilate and, and Herod were both in Jerusalem because of the Passover. Verse 8, now Herod was very glad that Jesus was coming to see him because he's always wanted to see Jesus, right? But not for all the right reasons, because he had been hearing about him and hoping to see some sign performed by him. And he questioned him at some time, but... He answered him nothing. Circle that phrase. Jesus didn't say a single word to Herod. You'll see why here in a moment. Chief priests, scribes were standing there accusing him violently, and Herod with his soldiers, after treating him with contempt and mocking him, dressed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him back to Pilate. The mockery, the beatings, the, the scoffing continue. So all of a sudden now he's back in Pilate's hands. And Pilate and Herod became friends at that moment, which was unheard of, right, because they had been at enmity all along, but the one thing that bound him at this moment, moment was the fact that they just want to get rid of Jesus. Verse 13, Pilate summoned the chief priests and the rulers of the people and said to them, you brought this man to me as one who incites people to rebellion and behold, having examined him, I have found no guilt, again, innocence to what you're describing, right? Nor has Herod, by inference, Herod found no guilt in this guy, right? So you're hearing it from the Jews, you're hearing it from certain, you know, the Romans, this guy's innocent, isn't it interesting, like how many times we've, we've probably heard this account and we thought, well, didn't everyone pronounce him guilty? Not everybody. But check this out, verse 17. Therefore, though, I'm going to compromise. I'm going to beat him up a little bit, then I'm going to release him. <laughs> so those of you who want to execute him, hopefully a little violent beating will, will satisfy you, but eventually we're going to let him go. Now look at verse 17. Now he was obliged at this time to release a prisoner because of the feast. And they all cried out together saying, away with this man, Jesus, and give us Barabbas. So we all have, are somewhat maybe familiar with this account. There was a guy who was, as it's described, verse 19, he was an insurrectionist. He was a murderer. He was a thief. And Pilate basically goes, hey, on the day of Passover, right, when we celebrate, you're allowed one prisoner to be set free. So they go, we don't want Jesus. We want Barabbas to be set free. And Pilate pleads with them. As if like, oh man, they really took me up on this offer. I, I wasn't intending them to. And they said, no, we want Jesus crucified. Crucify him, verse 21, crucify him. And he said to them a third time, why, what evil has this man done? Again, I think we have Pilate somewhat like, un we don't understand him. He's, like, he's trying to get Jesus off the hook. Isn't that interesting? Like he's, he's like trying to get Jesus off the hook. I have found him with no guilt. Therefore, let me just punish him and send him away. But they were insistent. All of a sudden, a mob rule mentality starts to form. They were insistent with loud voices that he be crucified, and their voices began to prevail. And Pilate pronounced sentence that their demands should be granted. He caved. History tells us that Pilate had lost control of the crowds earlier in his career. And that the Caesar put him on probation. And so he's looking out for his own position. And he's like, I can't let this get out of hand. I'll just give them what they want. Verse 25, and he released the man they were asking for, Barabbas, who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder. And he delivered Jesus to their will. May God write his eternal truths upon our hearts this morning. So five scenes I want us to unpack this morning. And the, and the first one is this. has to do with Annas. Annas is the one who's on trial, and he's the one that displays an angry heart. Now, some of you need to understand the background of this because he's at the home of the chief priest, uh, Luke chapter 22, verse 54, and at the home of this retired chief priest, Annas, who still has influence over the land. He's there with the soldiers, and, and they're beating Jesus up. Annas is on trial because Annas is the one whose pocketbook had been impacted by Jesus negatively. Remember when Jesus went into the temple courtyard and started turning over tables? 
and releasing all the animals, all the profits that were made in that situation went to Annas' pocket. Annas didn't forget the fact that he had lost tons of money because of Jesus turning over those tables. You think he's harboring a little bitterness? I think so. See, here's the thing. Annas was deeply impacted in his pocketbook and therefore hated Jesus. I'm going to tell you right now, when you start messing with people's pocketbooks, they don't just sit idly by. You can look at an account in Acts chapter 19 when Paul goes to Ephesus and they made these little statues that were being sold. And and Paul basically goes in there and says, quit buying these statues. You need to worship the one true God. And all the business people were like mad at Paul because they're like, dude, you're impacting our business. No one just sits idly by when you start affecting their income. Annas couldn't wait to get Jesus in his presence. And you and, and John 18, write that passage down because Luke doesn't unpack what happens with Annas like John does. But all you need to know from John is that Annas and Jesus have a brief conversation and it's really about witnesses because Annas says, Jesus, really? Who, who are you? And Jesus says, I'm not going to answer you. You can go ahead and bring some witnesses in because that was proper protocol. Everything illegal, uh, everything that's going on with Jesus right now is going on I- illegally against the law. Middle of the night trial, right? No witnesses, trumped up charges. There's no evidence. All this is because guilty men want to crucify Jesus. But all Annas can think about is how angry he is. And it's transferred onto Jesus by allowing the soldiers to beat him up. And I'm going to tell you something. The mockery that happens with Christ... Is, is heartbreaking. And men and women will always mock that which is not appreciated. See, these guys appreciate position. They appreciate power. They appreciate profits, right? And yet here is God himself in front of them, and they can only mock him. This tells us that sometimes our hearts will treasure the wrong things why Jesus says in Matthew 6 verse 33 seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all other things will will take care of themselves God's not against position and God's not against power and God's not against profit but when you make that your end all be all goal then it becomes a problem and you get angry with God Let's be honest, we, I think we've all been angry with God for one reason or another. As a 15-year-old who lost his mom to, to glioblastoma cancer, she was 39 years of age, and I watched her deteriorate in two months. Do you think I was angry towards God? You better believe it. You, you take your, my mom from me and watch my mother-in-law suffer from colorectal cancer and to watch some dear friends turn their, turn their backs on me and betray me. And, and I mean, let's just fill in the blank. All of us can come to God, and, and because of our th- our plans and our wills and our wishes were never fulfilled according to the way we wanted to. We hold our fists at God. And then I'm convicted because I look at a guy like Job who had so much taken from him. And here's what Job says. And, and I, I, how do you even get to a place where you say these things? The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of our God. You know what, here's what we do. We don't mock God and we don't get angry at God when we appreciate the fact that you even have life, that you even exist, that you even have a breath, that you're even in a context right now where you are able to just appreciate him. When you appreciate God, you can can wrestle with him. You can be angry with him, but that's not, that's that's short-lived. You'll never mock God that which you appreciate. And so, Annas is on trial. Like, dude, you're, here's God right in front of you. You claim to be a religious leader, and yet all you're concerned about is your power, your position, and your profits. So then he shuffles them off to Caiaphas, point number two. Caiaphas is his son-in-law. And now this is the active leader of the Sanhedrin, which is the collection of all the religious leaders of the day. Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes, chief priests, they're all in this group called the Sanhedrin. That's why Luke uh, 22, verse 66 says, the council of the elders gathered. That's also what we call the Sanhedrin. Caiaphas 
and the Sanhedrin were the guys that have been active since the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. He's saying, we need to get rid of this guy. Why? Because he's claiming to be God. Here is the issue. We're going to get this guy on theological grounds, and that is he's committing blasphemy because he claims to be God. So here it is, early morning, all night they've been, beat, they've been beating up Jesus. They've been mocking Jesus. Jesus is tired, right? He was just in the garden hours before. He was betrayed by Judas. Now, early in the morning, Caiaphas gets a, a knock on the door. Hey, we're going to bring forth this collection of leaders because we need to get rid of Jesus. Now's our time. So you can just imagine Caiaphas going, okay, let's just get this over with. And they all assemble. Look at verse 66. They all assemble, and they just start drilling him because here's the main issue. Who are you, Jesus? Because if you dare call yourself God, you're a dead man. And notice he's in a catch-22 situation, right? He says, if I tell you, you're not going to believe. Here's the problem. They have unbelieving hearts. The evidence is right in front of their faces, and yet they still refuse to acknowledge the truth. Matter of fact, write that word down, truth. Truth exists, <laughs> especially in a culture that seems to want to relativize everything. Right? The person who comes to you and says, there is absolutely no truth, you just push back and say, can you say that truth absolutely? Absolutely. It, it, it falls in and on it of itself, right? You cannot make an absolute statement about truth unless truth absolutely exists. So truth is the embodiment of Christ, right? He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, right? Here's the problem, right? They're trying to get this guy on theological grounds, and the moment he says he is God, they're like, we've got this guy. Can I just tell you... Uh, I was studying religious studies at ASU, and I know that sounds like an oxymoron. Like, these are two things that can't exist. Religious studies, ASU. Well, not that ASU is the bastion of religious studies. But I, I, I was thinking, you know, this is a springboard to, to seminary and graduate school. I ended up switching from religious studies to history because I could get done a, a, a semester sooner. So, yay! But I took some great classes. I took classes on, on Judaism and Islam and, and Christianity. I hung out with uh, Rabbi Barton Lee, who was the uh, professor of, of Jewish studies. Him and I had lunch. It was amazing. We'd sit down and talk about scriptures that pointed to Jesus and to see him explain away the truth and to make passages mean something that they weren't originally meant. Respectful, kind, yeah. But it's amazing how you can have the scriptures with somebody who's astute in, in Hebrew ignore how, how Christ is present in the Old Testament. New Testament class, 150 students. I'm going to tell you right now, the goal of every religious studies professor at ASU, here's the goal, and they make this known. If you come in loving Jesus, our goal is to make sure you leave not loving Jesus. They said that. And I'm part of me being this, you know, full of piss and vinegar 21-year-old. I was on the seven-year plan at ASU. So here I was in class. To hear him say, my, you know, our goal is to make you not love Jesus, I'm like, I'm like digging my feet and going, oh, this is going to be fun, right? New Testament class, Dr. Charles Emerson, who was a pastor at a church in Scottsdale, part of a group called the Jesus Seminar. Write down Jesus Seminar. Google it sometime. This is a group of men that would gather yearly and vote on the things Jesus didn't say and the things Jesus didn't do. And eventually you strip all the supernatural, all the deity, all the miraculous away, and you just have a guy who says a lot of pithy sayings. So here I was in Dr. Emerson's class, who, outside of class, Dr. Emerson and I would grab lunch and have great conversations. So I love him. We respectfully disagree with one another. He made a statement in class, so 150 students. Here I was. He makes this statement and says, Jesus never called himself God or equated himself with God in the Bible. And I said, Dr. Emerson, what about, and what about, and I gave him like six passages. And all of a sudden, Dr. Emerson thought, let's just change the subject. Like, part of me inside is going, yes, I got him. But I didn't want to, I don't want to be that guy, right? You can disagree without being disagreeable, amen? Don't be a jerk, right? Just have your, have your convictions, have your opinions, but don't be a jerk. I had students come up after class saying, thank you for saying that. Because when you're in a class of 150 kids, like, no one's going to be the one going, like, oh, yeah, I'm going to disagree with you, right? Everyone's just kind of, like, towing the party line and doing that thing. But we developed these relationships among the students where, guess what? We respectfully had an ear with Dr. Emerson outside of class, and I just prayed for opportunities to challenge him. He was so much older than me and so much more experienced, but yet you can't just ignore what's there. 
this is one of those passages where Jesus clearly says, I am God. Look at the statement he makes in verse 60, uh, 70, 69, 70, right? He says, uh, verse 70, they all said, are you the son of God? And he says, yes, I am. And when he said those two words, I am, it immediately takes you back to Exodus. When there's the burning bush scene, Exodus chapter 3, Moses is before God, who's made himself known as a burning bush. He says, take off your sandals, Moses. You're on holy ground. He commissions Moses to go to Pharaoh. And Moses says, who shall I say sent me? He says, tell him I am sent you. This is not the only time Jesus refers to I am, John chapter 8. He equates himself with God. They prepare to stone him, and he disappears. Ladies and gentlemen, it is obvious It is there. The Bible says when evidence is right there in front of your eyes and you refuse to acknowledge it, it's called blindness and ignorance. Romans chapter 1 says men and women suppress the truth and unrighteousness. I'm behind a car the other day on the road, and and let me just say, if you are the person that owns this car, I'm not assuming you're here but they had in big bold letters on their back window something that I loved, but I also hated at the same time. It said this, you know there is a God, Romans chapter one. Big bold letters, that's all it said. You know there is a God, Romans one. Part of me is like, yeah! And then part of me is like, how is this resolved with someone who's behind that person going, okay, what do I do now? Right, like it's the truth, but it doesn't leave, so what? There's a God. What do I do, right? Like, I want the other part of the message. How does the driver assume that people are going to be like, oh, wow, that really sparked something of interest in me. I'm going to pursue it further. Like, it, it, it brings conviction, but it falls short of conversion. Here's the reality of what that car says, that everyone knows that there is a God. Why? Because Ecclesiastes says he said eternity in our hearts. Romans 1 says, creation testifies that there's a God. Romans 2 says, your conscience testifies that there's a God. Romans 3 and 4 go on to tell us that Christ is the embodiment of what creation and conscience tells us. See, men and women know there is objective truth. The problem is, it's not because of lack of evidence. You want to know what the problem is? We don't want to be accountable Let me just tell you right now, I want to be my own God. I want to call the shots. I want to define what morals are and ethics are and what's right and what's wrong, what's truth, what's false. I don't want to be accountable to a God who's going to tell me what to do, especially when I don't like it. Can anyone else give me an amen on that one? Am I alone in this? No. These men are hardened and hopeless because they have unbelieving hearts. And you know what? We are not immune as believers in Christ to unbelieving. Because unbelieving happens in our lives when we have a mold that we want God to fit into. And we'll only believe God to the extent that he fits my mold for him. And Jesus comes to these religious leaders who had a mold. And when Jesus didn't line up with their preconceived understanding of who God should be and what the Messiah should look like, they set out to crucify him. This is, this is the hardest heart there is in the world. The heart that says, you have rejected, I've rejected the truth and there's nothing you can tell me. I'm going to oppose whatever you're going to bring to me. The, it's not a lack of evidence. It's a lack of accountability that perhaps your God is bigger than the mold you've made for the God you want. You don't want the God you want. You want the God that there is. So these are men and women who have unbelieving hearts. They will find a way to reject and avoid truth no matter what. I'm watching this interview with Alice Cooper. So for those of you who don't know Alice Cooper, who we know us from such anthems as school's out for the summer, right? So Alice Cooper years ago became a Christian. And matter of fact, he is part of the church that God saved me in. Uh, in, in, in Phoenix, and it was his wife who was instrumental. So his wife was one of his dancers when he used to tour back in the day. His wife comes to know Jesus, starts singing in the church choir, says, hey, his real name is Vincent Fournier. So he sa- she says, Vince, you need to come with me to church. He goes to church, becomes a believer. 
And uh, if you listen to his music, like in recent years, and I'm not saying, you know, you have to, but there's definitely this, this spiritual bent to his music that leans towards honoring God and glorifying God and stuff like that. So he's being interviewed by a pastor this past week, and, and, and the pastor just says, you know, what is it with people in our world today that they, they don't believe? And here's what Alice Cooper says. So I'm not quoting lyrics from schools out. I'm quoting lyrics from a recent interview, all right? Here's what Alice Cooper says. He says, people go out of their way to not believe in Jesus. And I thought that was so, like, right on. Like, here's, here's the reality of unbelief, right? People, let's just call it what it is, they're just being intellectually dishonest. They're being intellectually dishonest. Many people hide behind what they don't know in order to avoid what they do know. The reality of it is this. They would rather confirm their rejection of Jesus than be convicted by the evidence of who he truly is. Yale just appointed a chaplain to oversee their chaplains. And the interesting thing about this chaplain is he's an atheist. Now, I don't know anything, if you know what a chaplain is. A chaplain is supposed to lead somebody religiously. Now you get an atheist chaplain. That's like saying you're going to have jumbo shrimp. What is it? Is it a jumbo or is it a shrimp? <laughs> Dad joke. I know. Bad one. But it's interesting. So this man who's appointed chaplain of chaplains at Yale. Yale used to be a God-honoring university. Matter of fact, one of its presidents was a guy named Jonathan Edwards couple hundred years ago, many would consider the greatest mind ever produced in America. Jonathan Edwards was a preacher, pastor. He became president of Yale at the age of 21 years old. He wrote a famous sermon that I read as a freshman in a public high school, I know, believe it or not, called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And what it displays is this picture that you and me are sinners, that God dangles over the flames of hell, and we are just held on by a little bit of a spiderweb thread. And God could drop us in any moment. Like, this was pre-Christ in my life. I'm reading this, and it was the next year that, I, that God saved me. But Jonathan Edwards was president. Gail has come a long way from Jonathan Edward days. They appoint an atheist chaplain to oversee their chaplains. I think they have 40 chaplains. This guy wrote a book called Good Without God. What he's doing is he's placating to a culture that says, we don't need God to accomplish things as humans. Matter of fact, one of his sentences he says is this, and I want to show you how, how full of fallacy this one sentence is. He says, we are around, to, we, we exist to discover what it means to be a good human and live an ethical life. Write down the word good and write down the word ethical. Without God, those words are meaningless. So who then becomes the arbiter of what's good? Who then defines what ethics are? See, he concludes in a New York Times interview and says this, we don't look to God, a God for answers. We are each other's answers. And I look around and go, how's this worked out for us so far? <laughs> See, let me, let's just be honest. This is pride. Whenever you say we don't need God or God doesn't exist, we can go ahead and define our good and our ethics. This is called making things worse. Because this is the problem we've got ourselves into to begin with. We ourselves assume the place of God. This is the pinnacle of the unbelieving heart. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. Psalm 14. Ladies and gentlemen, I have had men and women in my own family who were who were staunch atheists angry people and, that, and that's anis the angry heart sometimes anger leads you to just this perpetuation of unbelief and your heart becomes so calcified to the truth there's no more evidence you can bring and i'm going to just tell you right now you don't ever give up on people but perhaps you resolve in your mind that i can't bring anything more that's convinced somebody i've just got to pray for them and you pray, and you pray, and you pray. 
Because once someone willingly just rejects the truth when it's so obvious, what, what more can be done? This is how powerful unbelief is, but I believe in a God who's more powerful than any unbelief that could ever be conjured up in this world. And I love how Jesus wraps up the session with, with Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin. Notice what Jesus says to them in verses 68, 69. Jesus quotes two, un, uh, two Old Testament passages. Daniel 7, write it down. Psalm 110. Because again, these are the guys that are on trial, even though they think they're in the driver's seat when it comes to judging Jesus. Here's what Jesus says, and I love how snarky. Can I say Jesus is a bit snarky here? Here's what he says. You guys think you're judging me? You don't know where I'm going. I'm going to sit at the right hand of the Father where I will judge you. But they miss it. They miss it. Notice he, he calls himself the Son of Man, which is a direct allusion to Daniel 7, which says the Son of Man shall go up into heaven and assume his position. And then Psalm 110 says, and the Lord will put his enemies as a footstool under his feet. So Jesus does two things. He says to these unbelievers, I am the person you need to bow down and worship. And secondly, I have the power, and it may not be on display right now, but it's coming to do exactly that. So he affirms his personhood as being God and he asserts his, uh, 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 asserts his power and says, one day I will judge you. And those men are being judged by God as we speak. 2,000 years of judgment because they did not believe the testimony of Christ. Whew. So the Sanhedrin are just like, all right, well, we've heard all we need to hear. Let's go get him crucified, and only Pilate can do that. So we go to, we go to Pilate, but before we get to Pilate, we're going to go to Herod because we're introduced to Pilate. Look at verse 1, chapter 23. So Pilate, again, it's early. I mean, the Jews might want to wake up early. The Romans don't want to wake up. They, they're, they're sleep. They're sleeping kind of guys. Pilate wakes up, and they're like, we got to rush this thing. We need this guy executed. The, the message isn't that he's the son of God, right? The message is that he's a revolutionary. He's calling himself king, and that is a direct assault upon Caesar, who is our only king. The Jews don't believe this. They just want to get this guy killed. So Pilate listens and goes, you know what? I'm looking at this king. He even asks him, are you a king? And he says, it is as you say it is. And, but Pilate's going, you don't look like a king. You look like someone who's just been really beat up, had a really bad night. But wait, you say he's from Galilee. That's Herod's jurisdiction. Send him off to Herod. Verse 6. So Pilate heard, says, go to Herod's chapter, uh, verse 7, verse 8. Herod, it was very glad to welcome him. Here's what Herod displays for us, a hedonistic heart. What's hedonism? It is pleasure seeking. It is a mentality of sex, drugs, rock and roll. Pilate didn't care about religion. He only cared about who was going to be sleeping in his bed that night and just having the best life possible. You want to know why we know this? Is because how he handled John the Baptist. This is the guy that had John the Baptist killed. Why? Because John the Baptist came to Herod and said, what you're doing in your family by divorcing this person and marrying, he even married his own family members, right? He said, you're wrong. And Herod didn't want to hear this. A woman comes out and dances for Herod. He's so smitten by her. He says, ask whatever you wish. Her mom says to her, tell him you want John the Baptist's head on a platter, which is everybody's party favor, right? Get the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And he kills John the Baptist. John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin. You don't mess with J.C.'s cuz. You know what I'm saying? So write that down. J.C.'s cuz. Don't mess with J.C.'s cuz, right? So here's Herod. Now all of a sudden, Jesus stands before Herod. Here's something you need to understand. Jesus says not a word to Herod. Nowhere else in the Gospels does Jesus not say a word to somebody. What you need to understand about Jesus is that Jesus always entertained sincere questioners. Herod is not sincere. You want to know how we know he's not sincere? Why did you want to see Jesus? He wanted Jesus to come and perform a magic trick for him. 
You're a miracle worker. You do all these wonderful signs. The circus is in town. His name is Jesus. All right, Jesus, jump through this hoop. And Jesus sits there and does nothing. And you better believe this irritates Herod. So much so he continues to say, all right, beat him up. And not only that, put a robe on him as if to mock this king, right? And so Herod is here only because he wants to be entertained. Jesus knows his motives, doesn't say anything to him. Almost also saying perhaps too, like John the Baptist said, everything to you that I would say to you, I'm not going to say anything. You, you had the chance. But Herod does not approach Jesus with pure motives. Herod only approaches because he's a pleasure seeker. Here's what I want to I share with you just briefly. God knows why you come to him. God knows what your motives are in approaching him. And I think there's a lot of people who experience the silence of God because they're approaching God as, what can he do for me? There's a lot of people who want to spend God on their pleasures, want to use God for their pursuits. And if you come to God with any other motive outside to worship him and revere him and to adore him, you may come up against the silence of God. That, I've known people who, on the surface, you're saying, they're saying a good thing. But deep down inside, when you start to explore through conversation what this person wants, it's anything but God. I want God to advance my, my career. I want God to, you know, to get me the, the person I'm going to spend the rest of my life with. I want God to do this for me as if, you know, God's this like monkey grinder and Jesus is the, the little monkey that dances on the side and, you know, like entertain us, like. Here we are now, entertain us. Like, it's Kurt Cobain. Some of you missed that cultural reference, but. Right? Like, this is what, we, God, you exist for me. And I tell you what, if you approach God with that mentality, you will experience the silence of God. He knows your hearts. Which is impossible for us to, to know and even diagnose. I don't know your heart. You don't know my heart. But how our hearts are revealed is in the things that we truly say, truly, truly what we treasure and love. You can say one thing, but your life is going to demonstrate perhaps something completely opposite. Hedonism outside of wanting God more than you want anything else, is a, is a, a dead-end street. Right? It's a dead-end street. I believe you can be a Christian hedonist. As a matter of fact, there's a great book by John Piper called Desiring God, one of the most transform transformative books I've ever read in my life. I read it as an 18-year-old, three years old in Christ, and this book has rocked my world ever since. It's called Desiring God, Meditations of a Christian Hedonist. Ooh. I didn't mention that first service, so obviously you guys need that second service, all right? <laughs> so Herod goes, well, if you're not going to do any jump through the, the, the hoop tricks with me, and you're just going to be this son, I'm going to move you back to Pilate. So Pilate gets him again. You know, I think Pilate's going, I escape responsibility. Herod's dealing with it, and all of a sudden, we're back. Here's what Pilate's heart reveals. Someone who's indecisive. So Pilate, and again, Pilate gets such a bad rap. I'm not saying he's a good guy, but I'm just saying this is a guy who literally declares Jesus innocent three times. And then fourth, because Herod by inference is like, I don't, I don't find the guy guilty. I don't like him because he didn't do any magic. I don't, I don't like him because he didn't do any magic tricks. But back to Pilate. See, Pilate is the indecisive heart. And, and you'll see why here. And this is, and this is so important. Pilate has this man in front of him who is claiming to be king. And Pilate's got no issue with that because he's like, he doesn't look like the king. He doesn't have the appearance of a king. John 19, write it down, has a great conversation between Pilate and Jesus. And there's two things that come out of this conversation I want to kind of springboard off of. 
Jesus says, I've come to, to, to share the truth. And then Pilate says, well, what is truth? Three, question, three words, most important question perhaps in the world. Outside of who is Jesus, what is truth? Write that down. What is truth? I think Pilate was part of a culture that had lots and lots and lots of gods. And I think it was a culture that really wanted to know what truth was, but it was relativized. So Pilate says, what is truth? Well, truth is standing right in front of him. But Pilate doesn't see it because of some, some things we'll talk about here in a moment. But then Pilate says, don't you know that I have the authority to take your life? And then Jesus says to Pilate, you would have no authority if it wasn't given to you from, from my Father who is in heaven. Woo! So this is spicy, right? This is, this is, this is good. Right? There's, a, there's a serious back and forth going on here. But there are two problems that prevent Pilate for seeing the truth in front of him. The first problem is this, that he was all about seizing power. And he wasn't about seizing Jesus. Even though Jesus had been seized, captive, placed in front of him, the embodiment of truth, Pilate missed it. Why? Because he was a lackey of the Roman government. And all he cared about this moment was saving his tail. Because he had already been warned by Caesar because of some previous disruptions that happened in Jerusalem where some Jews were killed. Tiberius put him on probation. And history tells us that if Pilate made one more mistake, he would lose his position. Here's the problem. When all of a sudden, all you care about is your position and you don't care about the plight of innocent people, that becomes a problem. See, again, there's nothing wrong with power and there's nothing wrong with position. There's nothing wrong with profits, right? But all of a sudden, when you are called to mete out justice, especially against the, with those who are being oppressed in an unjust situation, you are called to stand for humanity and not necessarily stand for politics in replace of that. There's a, there becomes a problem when you start, stop humanizing people and you start politicizing people. Jesus became a pawn at this moment. And, you know, here's the crazy thing, right? Is like he hears, Jesus hears the question, what is truth? Jesus has already said that the truth is what will set you free. But there's a caveat. Only if you acknowledge it. The problem with seizing power is that Pilate was blind to his own power. Hey, if I have the authority to kill you, I could, I could do that. And then Jesus humbles him and says, you have no authority if it wasn't given to you from my Father up in heaven. But he misses that because all he cares about is saving his position. His unwillingness to do what he knew needed to be done when it needed to be done. See, Pilate would have been a man of real courage if he released Jesus regardless of the consequences. Here's problem number two. He was a people pleaser. He's indecisive. Why? Because when your only conviction is to save your job and there's no other convictions that guard, gird, gird your life, you're, you're, a, you're a hopeless case. But secondly, when you're a people pleaser, because here's what, here's what Pilate resolved to do. Okay, I hear this group saying crucify Jesus, but then I'm going to go forth and tell the mob right outside like, hey, what do you guys want me to do? Like this guy has no backbone. He's trying to appease his own conscience, and he's trying to appease the chief priests and religious leaders in the crowd. In light of, let me mention this, Matthew says his wife had a dream the night before. And the dream, in the dream, his wife said to him, here's what I saw, this man Jesus, and you are to have nothing to do with him. His wife warns him. Don't have anything to do with Jesus. John tells us that he feared the person Jesus, but yet he ignored his wife's wisdom and he ignored the fear that was going on inside and he's trying to find this middle path. Sometimes hard decisions need to be made. Sometimes as believers, we need more conviction than, than we actually muster up. Too many times we're cowardly in, in, in putting our foot down saying, no, this is not right. 
Matter of fact, we wish this from leaders. I said something provocative, and I, and I don't mean it to be provocative in the sense, but that I, I, I hate President Biden. There's this instance that happened this week. I hate President Biden. You guys know what I'm talking about? The cowardice in dealing with what happened in control. Can I just say, I hate President Trump too. Now, I don't, just not carte blanche, like I'm not going around like, I hate these guys. Let me clear, clarify. I hate the way these guys act. I hate the way that sometimes they do things that are unpresidential. I hate the fact that sometimes they do things out of cowardice. Sometimes I say, hate the fact that they're not men of more conviction. Can I, is that fair? Yes. Don't, don't be the person that says, all my president does is right. You've got the wrong president. You're, you've got a, a false God. But President Biden this week, in the press conference the day after the bombings happened in Kabul, everyone was outraged. Democrats, Republicans alike. I've never seen so much unity around something so negative. Like, everyone said, this man, excuse the expression, he needs more balls. And the thing that I really was disgusted with, because you don't see a man acting presidential when it comes to a situation where there are people losing their lives, American men and women, soldiers, is when he says to the press, raise your hands if you thought, and all of a sudden it becomes like this, like, oh, I want to know what your, th you, the moment you start asking the press what their opinions are is the moment you've, you've lost control. Being president sometimes requires you, you, you're not democratic in dis decisions you make. Right? Like, a pastor, as much as you guys maybe don't want to believe this or believe it, right? Like, ministry's not a democracy. Like, I'm not saying, hey, we're all going to meet together and talk about the vision of the church. Like, you know what would happen if I just left this? Uh, we'd be going in a million different directions. Sometimes someone just needs to say, here's the direction we're going. This is what we're doing. And you know what's going to happen? There's probably going to be at least one person that doesn't like you. Because here's the problem with people pleasers. <gasps> I just want to make everybody happy. Here's the danger. You seek to make everybody happy, you end up making nobody happy. Think about Pilate. He's trying to appease the chief priest. He's trying to appease Jesus. He's trying to appease his wife. He's trying to appease the mob. Like in the end, no one's happy. Right, because there's a man who had acted cowardly rather than with conviction. He knew Jesus was innocent. Three times he declares it, yet he refuses to do what he knows deep inside he needs to do. When you know what's right and you don't do it, that's on you. You're, you're seizing something else. You're not seizing God. Right? There's a, there's a choice you have in life. You either fear God or you fear man. You can't do both. If you fear man, there's, God's not going to work in your life. But if you fear God, there are going to be people that don't like you. But I pray that God becomes that anchor because you're going to have to weather some tough storms. So here's Pilate. Trading substantive conviction for gutless complacency. It's the only way I could phrase it. He has replaced, he has traded substantive conviction, right? There is substance of conviction around him that he trades for gutless complacency. Yes, he gets a temporary calm from the crowd. He gets a temporary calm from the religious leaders. But I'll tell you what, when the suffer, when the innocent suffer under his rule, he has to live with that. History tells us that he eventually takes his own life. Can you imagine living the rest of your life as the one who allowed this innocent man to be crucified? He has to live with that. And all of us perhaps live with some sense of burden because we're either seizing things that are not God or we're trying to please people and we're bothered by it. Pilate saw, saw no other way than to take his own life. But in the meantime... The mob rule prevails. Look at, look at what, it, what, what it says here, right? They were, they were demanding. So Pilate says, okay, how, how do I bring compromise, right? And there's nothing wrong with compromise, but in this situation, he did, there needed to be more conviction. Tell you what, I'll just beat him up a little bit and then release him. 
Like, I'll give you, if, it, if it's blood you want, I'll give you a little blood. But I'm not going to kill them, and then we'll just release them. And they're like, no. And then so Pilate's like, tell you what, every Passover we set a prisoner free. Barabbas, get out here. Barabbas was an insurrectionist. He was a thief. He was a murderer. Thug. Write down thug. He was a thug. He wasn't like a national hero. But yet they wanted the thug instead of the innocent man, Jesus. And Pilate again says, really? It's almost like the off, you ever heard the phrase, offer you can't refuse? Well, he's doing the offer you can't accept. Right? Like when, the, when I was, a, in, in a, 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 I think I was a freshman or sophomore in college, right? I was doing some work for an old lady. And I, it was just me, and she gave me 20 bucks. And I think inside she thought I wasn't going to take it. And I did. <laughs> you, ever, you ever had an offer you can't, you can't accept? Like, she's thinking, oh, this is going to be an offer you can't accept. He's such a nice Christian boy. I know he's doing this out of the generosity of his Well, at that moment, my car was on empty and I needed some gas. <laughs> so I think she put it out there thinking he's not going to accept it. I'm like, thanks. <laughs> oh, wow. He really took me up on my offer. <laughs> okay. Pilate's doing the offer. Like, surely these people aren't so crazy to go, we want Barabbas, go ahead and crucify Jesus, and yet they were. Let me just tell you something about mob justice. And I love what a pastor said recently, especially with all the stuff going on with George Floyd. And we live in a world that loves to put things in front of the word justice. Racial justice, climate justice, social justice. Anytime you put any word in front of justice, you disqualify the idea of justice altogether. Anytime you put any word in front of justice, you disqualify God's heart of justice from the, from the get-go. I think there's wisdom in that. Don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not against racial reconciliation. I'm not against any of this stuff, making the world a better place to live in, climate stuff, right? Yeah. But the moment you start talking about justice, here's, here's the problem. The only way to have justice in any situation is to care more about truth than we do about ourselves. See, the problem is when I come in and I've got my agenda and you've got your agenda and this is about me and what I want, truth is off the table and it becomes a mess. See, if we sacrifice truth, we will always miscarry justice. Always. A judiciary with people ruled by their own political interests will soon give the people what they want rather than what is right. Can we just not see this in place in the culture today? Yeah. Boy, with, with all the spending and just everything going on with our, our politics and our government, we are a culture, and especially at leadership levels politically, that lack any sort of backbone or balls or whatever you want to call it, conviction that says, at some point, you got to say no. Because getting what you want will never accomplish what we need to do that is right. Someone's going to get hurt. Someone's going to be disappointed. Someone's going to be bad. <laughs> get over it. Right? Get over it. I don't know if you're here. And you can relate with an angry heart. I don't know if you can relate with an unbelieving heart. I don't know if you can relate with a hedonistic heart. I don't know if you can re relate with this indecisive heart. Here's the one thing I know we can all relate with. The last one. Barabbas. The condemned heart. What we have in Barabbas is the gospel on full display. And honestly, maybe you've never considered the person, prisoner, Barabbas before, but I want, I want you to think about something. This is, this is a character that all four Gospels write about. That's a rare thing when it comes to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. When you have a character in all four Gospels, all four of those Gospel writers want you to pay attention. Nothing outside the Gospels is known about Barabbas. But what we do know is that he was a thug. And Barabbas 
is on trial, <laughs> literally and figuratively, because he deserves it. He's a criminal. And yet, history knows nothing of this guy outside the Gospels, and his name is a very interesting name. His name, Bar, means son of Abba, the father. And it's interesting, like, it's, 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 a, it's like a common name. It's nothing, you know, it's not like, hey, you're the son of the jumping alpacas in the mountains and whatever the Hebrew is for that or Greek for that, right? Like, it's a simple name that I think God uses this real-life character to say something about general humanity, men and women, that we're all sons and daughters of the Father, and we all stand condemned before him. I, I want you to think about this. Think for a moment what it must have been for Barabbas. So here it is, Friday morning. This is crucifixion day. Right? Any of you have that on your calendars? No? no. This is crucifixion day. Barabbas wakes up that day assuming he's going to be dead by sundown. He's already been tried. He's already been declared guilty. Punishment, execution. But that evening, you're sitting down having dinner with your friends. Something monumental has happened. Barabbas can only point to a strange figure by the name of Jesus who, I think he had heard of this man he was a good man. He was a good teacher. And yet he's the one now hanging on a cross in your place. Here's Barabbas going, today I was destined to die, but because of Jesus, now I live. L literally, he's the first man, first person who could say, Jesus died not just for me, but instead of me. Jesus' death means the possibility of life for somebody else. No matter how severe the sin, no matter how long the rap sheet, release is made possible because of Jesus' death for you. Wow. Is this not a glimpse into every single one of our hearts today. You know, let's, let's just be honest. Let's, let's boil it all down. There's Jesus the innocent who got condemned. And yet Barabbas the guilty got pardoned. Did, did Barabbas deserve it? Even himself, he himself knew I deserve to die. But all of a sudden, he's out there, and there's Christ, and the crowd is chanting, crucify Jesus, we want Barabbas free. I think in his own mind, he's hearing this, going, this isn't right. But at the moment, all he's looking to do is save his own skin. We don't know what happened to Barabbas after this moment. History doesn't tell us. Do you think dinner that night was like, crazy thing happened today? Like, this person, Jesus, died where I should have died. We don't know what happened to Barabbas. Was there ever a moment in Barabbas' heart where he thought to himself, you know what? At some point, while Jesus is taking his last breath, maybe I need to, just to scream up to him like, thank you so much, I owe you everything! Probably not. But I would imagine at some point in his life that that thought sunk in. I wonder how long he lived his life remembering that someone took his place. Let me close with this, you guys. This is the gospel. We all stand condemned before God. We're all guilty before God. We all deserve the sentence of eternal death. But Barabbas is a, a, a good parable for all of us, right? And that God loves us and he loves us so much that while we are yet sinners, Christ dies for us. Woo! Yes! Our freedom 
from condemning guilt isn't achieved by anything we're able to do. We can't free ourselves. We are condemned not just by ourselves, but outside forces. But it's achieved, freedom is achieved by Christ dying in our place. And that gift is free for those who are able to believe and receive it. And so the question isn't necessarily, we don't know what what Barabbas did after this pardoning, but the question is, what are we going to do? Knowing that Jesus didn't just die in Barabbas' place, but Jesus died in our place. Condemned I stood before a holy God until that moment God transformed my heart and set me free. I'll tell you what I'm going to do today. I'm going to celebrate that not going to take it for granted. I was once condemned, but now I'm liberated. By anything I could do myself? No. Because of him who took my place. Today, I'm going to fall on my knees in worship and gratefulness. Today, I'm not just going to pass on casually, ignoring people and their desperate need to be forgiven. I'm going to be the one who says, I was once blind, but now I see. I was once captive, but now I'm liberated. We live in a world, ladies and gentlemen, where there's others who are in bondage. The gospel frees. The gospel delivers. The gospel sets free. And all God's people said, have you been set free? Have you been set free by the substitutionary love and sacrifice of Jesus himself? Live in that. And share it with others. What an incredible, incredible gift. Mm. Let's stand, let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning, for the reminders, for the convictions. Lord, for the ways your spirit works in our hearts and our minds. I mean, there's been so much here. There's probably so much that many of us are just kind of, we're, we're, we're allowing to stir we're, we're allowing it to change us. And Lord, we, in, we invite you to do that within us. Change us. But Lord, may there be no change apart from true, true conversion. Lord, radically upset our lives so that we will realize Jesus is all we need. Thank you for such grace. Thank you for such kindness. Thank you for such mercy. Thank you for being a God who upends our lives and shows us the beauty of the gospel. There is no condemnation for those of us in Christ Jesus. And the truth has set us free. May we walk and live in that freedom because that's what you've given to us through the cross of Jesus Christ. May you be glorified in all our words and deeds. May you be exalted in our lives forever. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for delivering us. Thank you for being our God. We pray this all in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face toward you and give you his grace and peace forever. Have a great day, guys. See you soon. We'll see you at bowling.